records. Yeah. I think 20 or so. 19, 18. <laughs> okay. Okay. You can shut it off so that we and I see before. I'm not able to read this okay, before okay. I start. No worries.
use this one. Uh, I mean, use for the moderator can take this one. All right, I think we'll get started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session on multilingualism in education. Um, I think in the interest of time, we're gonna just get right started, but, um, but I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Lucia Indebula, and Lucia is a school's um, sales manager with Longman South Africa and Oxford University Press, and before that, she's worked as a trainer, a school trainer in literacy and language education also in South Africa. So we're just gonna get right started and I'm gonna hand over things to Lucia. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Chloe. It is indeed a great privilege for me to moderate this session today because education and language issues are really something that uh, I'm very passionate about, myself being a product of uh, those uh, debates and, and experiences around language and using language for learning. So this morning we, we, we will discuss on how multilingualism and multiculturalism comes into play in the education sector. We all know that language is a very important component of the a political and a social economy. And I think we are aware that in African countries, language has always been a political and a social hot potato. And so because of the multicultural and multilingual nature of our societies, language becomes even more significant. And 
this morning we are going to discuss, the panelists will discuss the importance of language and its place in education. Uh, the debate around language still rages on today and the debate around education rage on today. So the core challenges lie in having, um, being able to be sensitive to the social and cultural complications that go with language and having to also figure out where the language of the former oppressor is in the whole, in the whole mix. So beyond these concerns, there are concerns around which is the best language to actually teach children in, in schools and up to what level? And how does that affect the educational outcomes? So the panel this morning, I have two veterans in this field who are going to uh, talk about pertinent issues pertaining to multilingualism in education in Africa with a special consideration of the ways in which public, uh, private, and non-governmental organizations can actually facilitate the change that is needed uh, to best improve the educational outcomes of the large African uh, youth population. So it is a privilege, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce uh, Dr. Christine Glanz, uh, who is our first speaker. Dr. Christine works as a program specialist at the UNESCO Institute of Lifelong Learning, and she has been there since 2003. She has particularly worked on the quality of education in the African region with a focus on the multilingual context, literacy, youth, and adult education. And of note, she is one of the editors of the UNESCO ADEA publication entitled Optimizing Learning, Education, and Publishing in Africa. Thank you very much, Christine, for being here. So you can take the floor. Good morning, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. It's also for me a big, big pleasure to be here. I'm very grateful to the organizers that they invited me to speak to you and to share uh, what you know we are doing at UNESCO and the way we are collaborating with African countries in order to develop quality in education. Um, I've brought copies of the three uh, studies that uh, we were involved in and they are also accessible online. Um, I think, let me start my presentation. So, oop. I think I've pressed the wrong button. No? <laughs> and please take me back. Where do I press? Right, on this one. Yes. So when I thought about what can I uh, really share, it, it's really these in, um, studies because they have been quite influential. And so I, I will just share with you the gist of it. It would be very difficult to share all the details, but I hope to make you interested and that you will take a look in these publications and read and maybe um, get in touch with me also afterwards if you are interested. And then I'm also trying to give you insight in our work. So I will mention some organizations here and there so you see with whom do we work and how. UNESCO's mandate is to promote social justice and peace and we organize policy dialogue, uh, stimulate research, and work a lot with uh, practitioners also in the field of education, member states, and researchers. So we always have these three, the government, the research, and the education practice. Mm -hmm. It's not, <laughs> okay, I have to get used. I'm taking you back, the whole thing started in 2003 with the uh, African, uh, is the ADEA is the Association for Development of Education in Africa. It's a high level association that brings together ministers, key researchers and practitioners from education, 
by that time every two years, now every three years. It's a very important meeting. In 2003, they discussed quality of basic education and a general concern was that um, the quality of, I mean, the results of education, they persist to be unsatisfactory. High dropout rates, high repeater rates, even um, sometimes resistance against education, saying it's alien to us, it's not our education. And so one of the major themes during that conference was how can we adapt curricula to the use of African language? It's a long debate, as Lucia has said, but um, um, I think the reason why I'm here is, has started at that time. And ministers requested that there should be really more investigation on mother tongue and bilingual education. So as a consequence, um, the ADEA commissioned a study to our institute. By that time, our director was one of the intellectual leaders. I think he is one of the intellectual leaders in the field of education and um, language, a, Ma a Malian, his name is Adam Marwan. And so I think that's why we also got the mandate to coordinate the study together with GIZ, the German um, what at the development organization, which for a very, very long time promoted education in African languages uh, on the continent. And our guiding question for the study was, um, which policies, approaches and practices provide education for African children, uh, adolescents and adults through the best suited media and curricular content to serve social cohesion inclusion and sustainable development. So we did not only look at um, school education, but also for adolescents and adults. And it was a major review process where some uh, six um, specialists in theory and practice were selected to look at what actually comes out from the over 40 years of experience in mother tongue and bilingual education on the African continent. And um, they also, so they looked at programs and policies in 25 African countries. Um, came up with the first draft, which was critically discussed in a major expert review meeting, where all the, um, or a lot of the African specialists in the field were invited to discuss this draft. The meeting was hosted by Namibia. And um, after that meeting, it was revised presented again at the next biennial, again um, with governments and everybody who was there. And then we, we came up with a final publication with is this one in 2011. Um, so as you can see, uh, many countries were involved in this process and many specialists. Now the question or the uh, topic for this panel, my question was how can I, 400 pages, how can I you know, share the gist of it? And my question is what are the findings and recommendations of this study with regard to language use that is conducive to good quality learning and education in Sub-Saharan Africa? In a nutshell, I would say that it requires, the conclusion from this study is that we will need a major or a general paradigm shift for school education. That's what came out from it. Um, and the shift means that we need to work with a multilingual and multicultural sub-Saharan African context, uh, which requires a mother tongue based multilingual approach and works with the linguistic repertoires and needs of the learners of all age groups and their teachers. This is really in a, in a nutshell, but now how to do this? Um, there's no one solution for every country, as we said this morning. The countries are different, the contexts are different. Um, but if we look at, for example, multilingual profiles, and we, they can be analyzed. Um, in everyday life, multilingualism is normality. Here, for example, you see different people of different age groups in Senegal. Um, the gentleman here is 26, he knows one, two, three, four, five, six languages. Vincent, he is three years old, knows two. And, and they share languages. Hossam, who is 47, he has this huge linguistic profile. Edward, who is 14, already has a linguistic profile of four languages. And the question is, um, how do we work with it in education? 
Uh, we know that there are many languages spoken on the African continent. There are different estimates. And we can see it also in the daily reality. Here, for example, it's a picture from Uganda. A lady who, is, uh, who has a stand, market stand sells newspapers in English. And at the same time, she has labels in Luganda for her products, locally made products. Here, this is a photo from Ethiopia where you can even see two scripts and uh, two languages. We know that uh, mass media, they use many languages. It's a mod radio moderator from Mozambique. And this is um, uh, just a picture of one of the films that is produced in Hausa from, based on a novel in, uh, in Nigeria. And uh, um, a survey from UNESCO Institute of Statistics found out that 56 of um, the Nollywood um, films, 56% are produced in African languages and 44% in English. So you see that even the market, there is a market for that is multilingual. What happens, um, I will skip this one. In many times in school, that's a cartoon from Niger and uh, where you can see what happens in school, that in schools, African languages are not a, a, a really an educational target. It, this cartoon says, you know very well that if you want to go to urinate, you have to say it first in good French. This is a picture, a situation that many children in Francophone African countries meet. And so you have, instead of dealing with multilingual profiles of the students, you see linguistic violence in school. And uh, the situation in many countries is, as you know, that the system focuses on teaching the official language, which used to be, uh, in many cases, um, colonial language. But the majority of people uh, are as not even fluent in these languages. So how to deal with the situation? A survey also found that African languages are very limited, uh, I mean, are limited to basic education. This is a survey from 2004. So it's not the latest, but just to give you an idea, and I think the situation hasn't changed that African languages are mainly used in basic education. So the question is, what linguistic academic competences do you develop in these languages? And how is this connected to the reality outside? And here we come to uh, one of the most important issues, that there's a disconnect between the educational environment, the home, the community, and the work environment, as I try to show you through these uh, pictures and figures. So, um, uh, again, synthesizing the study, we found that a familiar language of instruction and culturally sensitive curriculum, which builds on the prior learning and the learner's surrounding are critical for understanding new concepts, learning and expressing what has been learned, and also for using it outside of school. Five minutes. Thank you. So our recommendation is for education systems that they support learners to become skillful communicators in multilingual and multicultural settings, which means that there cannot be just one language that the education system targets at. It has to be at least two languages and also to a higher level. Uh, another recommendation is that uh, African languages are being valued and used as they are key to African realities. So we need to work with a linguistic context and build on prior learning of learners and teachers. And there should be effective language policies that uh, reflect everyday communication patterns. Mm, a second issue that is related to it, that comes out from this study, is that linguistic skills required in academic school tank contexts are often underestimated. Many teachers, they don't have training and understanding how do uh, humans develop language and literacy skills in academic context and how complex they are um, and how much time it really needs and um, is it really realistic to expect children to learn right away in a language they don't understand and that teachers don't master well. This is a situation that is, exists in many African countries. Um, so 
um, to acquire oral and written academic language competences in the mother tongue, that means L1. Mother tongue means one of the languages that I master as a child when I go to school. Uh, up to, and if, if we expect somebody to do well up to secondary level, it takes the majority of the students in less well-resourced schools at least eight years. And um, this is the findings of this study. And I think it's important to continue researching and finding out you know, um, what can be done. So a recommendation is, and what we can see from the good practices, is that they use mother tongue uh, as a le um, language of instruction um, the long as they can. And this means uh, either throughout primary, secondary education, um, throughout, or also uh, in an additive way, it means um, two languages of instruction while you first build the competences in the mother tongue and then you introduce a second language. Uh, or very late exit, um, that model means you will um, transit to a second language as a medium of instruction when um, after six years. Um, so it's very important that all teachers have to be trained in oral language and literacy development, that they receive training materials and teaching materials in the language they will use as a language of instruction. Many teachers in African contexts are expected to be translators. They don't really receive, they are expected to teach in a language, but sometimes they don't even have the materials, the teaching materials in the language they are used for teaching. So they really work under very difficult conditions. Um, we can have, we, we saw that uh, a lot of good practices have been developed in the so-called non-formal education sector, which is a bit more flexible than mainstream schooling because they have more freedom to experiment and to try out new things. Um, we s and these are some pictures. This is a um, family literacy program where parents get involved, also through using the mother tongue in primary education so that they can help their children and at the same time they also learn themselves. They become literate one minute. Um, this is a picture from a bilingual vocational school in Burkina Faso where they include also vocational training in primary and secondary education while using African languages and French. This is a picture from South Africa, the South African literacy campaign, which um, include all age groups and all national languages also in the Braille script, not to leave out people who, do, who are, who are uh, you know, uh, who cannot. Uh, and um, I think I would just like to share one more thing if I have the possibility because we also did an analysis of what do these um, educational programs in the so-called non-form education sector that develop programs for youth and adults, what do they do and what can we learn from them? And we saw that they, they really integrate uh, the languages of the environment. They work together with the learners. They take a real context-led uh, approach they uh, work with five guiding principles, which we synthesize, can synthesize in terms of inclusion. So they see how can we include learners that they stay and um, until the end of the program that they can keep being motivated. Um, they develop programs that address learning needs of all age groups. Um, I underlined the multilingual ethos, which means to really um, take an ethical view towards the multilingual uh, context and the multicultural context by accepting and valuing all languages and really trying to find out how can we work with it. And it's not easy. I don't say it's easy, but these are, you have many people who have already done a great job and from whom we can really learn. And it's a process. It's nothing we, we can just say we have acquired it and it's, it's there forever and it's one model for all. Sustainability, we, um, they, they really look at can the learners use what we teach them outside of school and outside of the educational program. And for this, they often make use of the principles of action research, means participation, collaboration with the communities. 
recently there has been a very interesting evaluation of a case in Uganda where parents were involved, even sitting in class, in mother tongue, um, bilingual education, and suddenly their parents, they got so inspired that they started developing learning centers for their communities. So you can see the importance of you know, using um, the languages that people understand and use in their everyday life. We have also developed a policy guide with 18 African countries and African specialists on how to integrate African languages and cultures in education. And um, I think I'm skipping. Well, maybe what's also interesting is currently we are working with uh, several Francophone African countries on a curriculum framework on how to train teachers for bilingual education. So these countries are moving. You see policy changes also. Senegal is really working on bilingual education, mainstream program, and, uh, and you are needed, and it's also needed. That's my wish that you will take, you'll be interested and in take proactive part in the developing of multilingual and multicultural education systems across all sectors, because education takes place in all sectors and um, not just in the educational, but also uh, business sectors and health sector and so on. And it is important to collaborate across the continent. So um, that's what I wanted to share with you. I hope it was interesting. And uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christine. And ladies and gentlemen, I would suggest that we take the next speaker before we take any questions, because I think most of the um, issues that are raised are applicable to both contexts that our panelists um, have worked in. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce to you Ms. Naledi Mbudeshale. Uh, Naledi is the incumbent director um, she works for the Department of Basic Education in South Africa, and she works in a province called the Eastern Cape. Those of you who have looked at the map of South Africa, we have been to South Africa. The important thing about the Eastern Cape is that it is the second largest province in South Africa in terms of learner enrollment, and it is the only province that has a unit called um, Language in Education Policy. So Naledi is the director for that unit. And the important thing is that the work that will be, the lessons learned in the Eastern Cape will be rolled out to the rest of the country. And her mandate, her mandate was to drive the transformation agenda of the constitution, constitution and all other legislative mandates pertaining to language use in education. So under her guidance, um, Naledi, Naledi has the background in math and science teaching, and she is the first official that requested that publishers make available math and science textbooks to schools beyond the grade of, beyond grade three in the native African language. It was a, a huge demand. The vocabulary didn't exist and all the other complex issues around um, a content subject terminology available in African languages. So Naledi at the moment is doing her um, PhD in teaching maths in grade 12 and she focuses on learners who are tested and taught in a language that is not their mother tongue. So it's a, very, um, it's a very critical thing that South Africa is grappling with at the moment. And she has produced this um, unit that she leads has produced the following materials under her leadership. They versioned all the national mathematics workbooks from English to Easy Corsa from grade four to grade six. They produced natural science and technology teacher guides for mother tongue based bilingual education strategy. The first, they published the first multilingual um, reader for grades in four languages. So the multilingual reader in four languages that are prevalent in the province, English, Africans, Isitosa, and Sesotho. Um, they have also published a learner braille book 
in A4 size with big fonts for, for learners who are visually impaired. So um, in her work, she also takes a sign language as one of the languages that uh, children must, be, um, must have access to. So now, lady, welcome and thank you very much. The floor is Afternoon. Oh, sorry. It's still morning. It feels because I've been on a plane for 11 hours. So I'm not, <laughs> I just got here this morning. Uh, morning, everyone. I'm hoping that um, my trip, which was very difficult getting here, um, will be worthwhile. My name is Naledi Ndombizanelli Mbude Shale. I have a very a difficult task today of trying to crunch everything into 15 minutes. But I'm hoping that the links that we will make um, will interest. I was saying to Christine earlier on, if, if I get one or two students, that, that's fine. I'm not a big fisher, fisherman. I'm a small fisherman, whether that's gender sensitive or not. But I, I, I try to have just one or two people in the audience that I can take home with. Um, so that you can continue the work that we are trying to do. South Africa has 11 official languages, and my experience today is more on what we try to do as a country. Um, the 12th language is sign language, and we are very, very far from doing anything significant in terms of producing materials and, and doing everything that we are supposed to be doing. But... Um, The reason I love this slide is that, you know, in grade R, as you see there, you, you, you have those four or five year olds who are just ready and who don't even know that getting to that green door is such a big thing. That when they fall along the wayside, you worry that when they started, they didn't know that their footing in education was, was dropped. The system just drops it for them. And that, that is what we should take from this present, these presentations, is that systematically we drop black children along the way because they don't speak English at home. That, that's basically what we do. You know, most people will say to you, language is just a means of communication. I'm sure that at this level you know that it, it's not about that. It is about how much symbolic power you have. I always package okay, when I speak in terms of the fact that we have a government in South Africa now that is in power, which is black, which is democratic, and the symbolic power it holds. And yet you have your cultural capital that is embedded in tools that are not in anybody else but in a few people who speak English. So when you go for an interview, you would always have to speak English. When you go for this, so it's, it, it's, it's not the fact that you're in government that is important. It is the fact that you hold that key for that child to go to the next step, whether it's an exam or a job. So if you are an African, you must always do better, not in what you know, but in English. Whether you are good or not in what you do, but the fact that you, you, you speak the language, for you, it's automatic that you will get the job. But it is the fact that so such a few minority of people function in English to get those jobs. So my discussions, and when I listen to people talking about the issue of economics and business and development without the language issue, you worry because it is we are not going to get into that space as long as we haven't sorted the, the language issue first. This is the distribution of South Africa as a country in terms of language. And you'll see immediately this is um, alphabetic. Ukutu, you have about uh, speakers of Afrikaans, 13.3% uh, of English, it's 8.2%. These are mother tongue speakers. In Debele, you have 1.6, it's a closer. You have 17.6, which is the second biggest group in the country. 
with Isi Zulu at 23.8%, Sibedi at 9.4%, Sisu 27.9%, and so on. Now, I'm trying to show you this slide because my next interesting slide is this one. It is about the distribution of speakers in the country. You open the television, you see the most performing province is the Western Cape or Northern Cape in, in terms of economics and, and, academic, and academics, and you wonder why. And then you get all this rhetoric about the, East, the, the Western Cape being well run and therefore performing well because we have a, put a certain political party that happens to be the Democratic Alliance. And if you can't read, if you can't read between the lines what that means, you would say, oh, I'm going to run to the Western, to the Western Cape. I mean, myself being born in the Western Cape, I know what children in Kailicha in the Western Cape do exactly the same way that kids in the Eastern Cape or in Gauteng do, as long as they are black. So it doesn't matter where you live. So what we see in terms of distribution and the languages they speak, this coincides or this tallies with the economic development and the academic achievement of learners in the country. You'll see with our 8.2% of English speakers in the country, they are more or less in the KwaZulu Natal. And mostly we have now um, most people of Indian origin who have lost their original languages, who now form part of the bigger English group. That's why we are having a rise in the number of English speakers in the country. And you see most in the whole country that there's literally nothing. And you have Isikosa speakers, and this is mostly my group, and they come from the Eastern Cape, where I come from. It's called the Zero Province, where nothing is supp supposedly is working, because there's a large group of a homogeneous African language speaking group who are not doing well in education because of the linguistic distance between English and Isikosa that they have to perform in, like those English speakers. The exam is the same. Everything is the same. And yet, there are opportunities to hear the language are so few and remote that they're expected to perform at that level. Now, if you tie the economic advantage or disadvantage of having a tool that you can't use, which is your home language, and having to perform in something else or in another language that you have to use, that you, you, you hardly hear outside of the classroom from a teacher who isn't a proficient speaker, you can imagine the economic development of the province. I'm here today because of our comparison and what this does to Africa as a continent. This perpetual cycle of underdevelopment is linked to what we see. And if you see our favorite color is yellow, and where we are in terms of international comparison with other countries, in terms of our academic achievement, uh, it's nothing to be desired. And this is why this discussion today should not be about whether we give African learners their right to learn in a language that they understand. It's a basic right of all children in different countries. It's nothing new. Uket uh, Komarik will always say from GTZ, Africa is like a pregnant lady who never gives birth. Every time there's a class in education, you do some research on language, and then another one you've seen the 40 years. So every time people want to understand why African children are not performing, the language issue comes up, and then it goes for research, and then another one. As if we haven't proved in the whole world, even in South Africa, that it's only white kids and colored kids who are learning through Indian Africans who are doing well. We don't need research for that. They are there as evidence. I want to talk about this slide, which is very helpful. The past percentage in grade one, two, and three of the home language is averaging at about 58%. Because of the amount of monies and expertise spent on developing the home language. So at least they are paying with 58% because everything that is there is English mainly. The materials, the training, and even the teacher training of those educators who have to go and teach the home language is in English. And yet they are expected to produce learners who are well rounded off, who can speak the language well. But at least it's 58%. Now I want to show you the next one. When these same learners are in grade four, they perform, at, in my province, at 38%. Look at their performance in English, it's 36%. Now, most African countries, 
have continued to the 1953 UNESCO guideline of continuing with the mother tongue for three years and then changing to English in grade four. Although it's practiced now, it's not policy, everybody does it. And you ask why, nobody knows why. Now, when you are performing at a language at 36%, how much are you going to be getting? You can't learn through a language and learn it at the same time. It's two different things. So this has contributed. We see this huge decline from grade three to grade four, and everything just be becomes a downward spiral right up to grade 12. This is the picture, not of South Africa, of Africa as a whole. This is the achievement. If in the Eastern Cape you have an average performance of 38.3% in the home language and 36% there, and all these learners... Now, the four provinces, the four provinces that you see in red are those provinces that uh, have a majority of Africans, language speakers, who are learning through their language, right up to university and English. You will see the Western Cape is 54.8, and they learn for that language. And the Northern Cape at 41% with Africans, Kauteng is a mixture of different languages, but they are completely multilingual from grade one with 49%, and Free State with Africans is 54.4. This, the strength that you have in the home language is not used as a vehicle to learn. So although you see the performance in the first national language, lang first national language, which is English, you still have to learn through it, even though you're not doing well in it. The reason I'm interested in, in what I'm doing in terms of mathematics and language is, is, is pr primarily because mathematics is, you, you map what you understand using numbers. So no child does not experience math mathematics in their everyday life. But the issue of mathematics in Africa as a whole, and that is why we have so few making it through schooling, because mathematics is a passing subject. If you have to learn mathematics, which is a language on its own, and learn a language, and learn through it and back to your language, it is what we call dual translation. You always are in a, a, between a state of learning two things at the same time. So as a country and as a continent, the issue of having engineers, doctors, psychologists, everybody else who's a high-level professional is none if we continue to say, for you to be able to go into the next field, know your English, before you know your maths. The test that was done for pupils um, in terms of the test language is a very interesting one. Learners who are learning through their language, you see the African learners shooting up, performing almost at the international level of 400, between 405. And as you go to the African languages, you will see what happens to, to children in South Africa. It's not rocket science. It's a simple scientific fact. But take away what children understand, then you will get what you see. This is the same here. You have your Africans learners and your English learners. And every year, you know, as, 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 as a manager in the Department of Education, you get called every year for the results. We, and every time you read and you see the results of children who are home language because of English, you would say that God has done something really unfair here. It's only white kids and African kids who perform in South Africa. What's wrong with black people? And nobody mentions the issue of language. It cannot be. So the racial stereotyping that it does, because when the results come out, it seems as if those black teachers are not teaching. Those black children do not want to learn. And yet we know that it is the frustration of having to do two things at the same time that nobody acknowledges. This was, I, I showed you this one. And um, my last one is on the legislative context. In South Africa, we have a history in terms of language policy. In 1652, when the settlers arrived, we had this period of Dutch being the language of education. It slave schools opened, and then we, have, uh, we had the English uh, colonizers coming through. But what hit us the most is the Anglo Boer War. Because it is when Lord Milner came with the Anglicization policy, you know, trying to fight with the Africaners that 
at the center of that war were black people. Because we were neither Dutch and English, we were somewhere in between. But the policy, the aggression of anglicizing came at that time. Because as a spoil of war, then the, the, the hold in on South Africa on English became more. And then you had your elites, then you have the children of chiefs going to schools, and English was something to be aspired for. And this is why conferences like this are important. Because the same people who have put up on that agenda that English is important must be part of the solution now. To say that our kids have mother tongue education. Therefore, for you guys to be at a level where children make it in school, something has to happen. We had Bandu education in 1954, and we had the, the war, um, the, 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 the uh, Soweto War in 1976, with official bilingualism. But now, everything else that we have, right up to 2016, we have three languages now in the system. For the first time, all children in South Africa must have three languages from grade one. It's a new law, it's a new policy, because the discovery that it doesn't help you to make sure that only black children learn an African language, while your so-called colored children and your white kids do not learn any African language, because when you, have, when you become a doctor, you will always need a translator next to you going to Kailija. If you, are, if you are a psychologist, you need someone to interpret for you. you, you it can't be your observation that this person is psychotic, whatever it is. So you are disabled in a way because as much as you are a professional, you still need somebody else to translate for you. So in terms of governance and the service delivery, there is some way that you are disabled as a person. This has come with a lot of um, resistance. We've had fights, but we have agreed as a nation that it's three languages from grade one, children where the home language is important, the first Asian language is important, and children can have an African language because to be African means that there must be a requirement that you do speak some African language so that you can communicate with your own people. Lastly, where to? In 2016, we shouldn't be debating whether an African language or it can't be. It's a basic right of all children to learn in their language. But our role should be compelling African governments to provide just the standard. Because the need for aid is perpetuated because of the fact that children just drop out of school because school becomes too much of a stress condition and therefore illiteracy and everything else follows. So it is our responsibility to make sure that children at least are multilingual. Now, multilingualism in Africa means different things, but for the purposes of this conference, it is not a luxury. It is expensive, but it is more expensive to have people who perpetually depend on aid. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, ladies. Uh, I will take three questions for our panelists. You can come and sit up here. We will take the first three questions, and after those three questions, if time allows, we'll take other questions. Thank you. My name is Peter, and I come from Uganda. Uganda is quite interesting, and I'm, I'm glad that UNESCO has done quite uh, huge amount of work there. Interestingly, Uganda has over 40 languages that are recognized. South Africa has just four or 11. Now, my question is, how do we move on from teaching kids in a country like Uganda, where we have 40 languages, and teach them either in the local language or in English? I still have a problem, personally, because I spoke five different languages as a kid. But I was being taught in English. And up to now, I have to, in most cases, I'm thinking in my local language or in two local languages, and then I have to move that into English. Now, I may be one of the most lucky kids, but how do we move on from there? Thank you. Hi. <coughs> Pardon me. 
Thanks so much for your presentations. My name is Saeed Husseini. I'm a doctoral candidate in international development. Um, my question is actually connected to the previous one in that um, <coughs> we kind of set this binary in some ways between local languages and, you know, often the former colonial language. But given that there's been, you know, a number of generations now since colonialism in many African countries, uh, if not all, <coughs> and I'm thinking of Nigeria now, which is my home country. Um, and given that in a country like that, you know, you have, uh, I mean, by some conservative estimates, something like 200, um, you know, local languages. And so, you know, you've had gen a generation now of people who have been taught, you know, perhaps not optimally to an optimal level, but in English uh, and, able to and are able to kind of conduct business in that way. Or some sorts of mixes of English and more traditional lang or local languages in the areas where they live. Uh, is there any thinking around um, teaching people in a version of English that, you know, is more appropriate to their context? So in Nigeria, for example, there's uh, Pidgin English, which is widespread and, you know, to some extent is a urban lingua franca. Uh, wh what's the thinking around that? Um, because, you know, you, you speak some of, you speak English in this way and within your home context, it's often considered to be, uh, you know, in, improper, that's incorrect English, uh, bad English. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, when you hear, for example, the way that the Brits speak English in comparison to, and this you know, analogy has problems, but in comparison to the way Americans speak English, it's significant differences. Uh, so is there any thinking around actually, and I suppose this is a two-part question, is there any, secondly, thinking around uh, adopting what was supposedly colonial country, uh, colonial languages um, in the way that they have been sort of, uh, in the way that they have evolved in, in the past 40 odd years uh, and, and making them ours? Thank you. Can you take this lady here and then get responses, then I will take it to the... I'll take the four of you after that, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. My name is Selma, and I'm actually trained to be a maths teacher, so this is like very relevant. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, Christine first started speaking about multilingualism and the value in speaking uh, your home language, but also being able to speak the language just taught at school. And then you went on further to talk about how the fact is that if you can't speak language, you find there, there are barriers when it comes to employment opportunities, further education opportunities. So therefore, a child needs their home language, the language taught at school, and they need English or the dominant language in the country. Is this actually an impossible task? Can a child grow up being this multilingual? And if you are, you speak several languages. If you need English to get a job, would you have the breadth of vocabulary? Would you be able to speak in the way that you actually need to get a job if you, you've had to split between all these different languages? And my second question is, I was working in the Western Cape, and like the teachers were trying to teach in um, Zulu, in Costa, English, and they simply couldn't do it. They said, can you draw a picture of a body, and where is the hand, where's the feet? They didn't even know the body parts. So how do you expect the teachers to meet this demand of teaching all these different languages? Okay, let's take the responses. Uh, first, Christy. Uh, how can I switch this on? It's on? Okay. Yes, thank you for your questions. Um, the first question comes from Uganda. And um, yes, Peter, when you, when you explained your question, you said, okay, um, should it be either African language or English? I think the, uh, the issue is not either or, mm. it is and. And we have to find, for, find solutions for the end. And then you ask how to go about using um, local, yes, the 40, let's say 40 local languages in teaching in your country. So as I try to suggest and what is being done, so that, I mean, some countries, they identify, as we, as we have seen from the linguistic profiles, um, most African children, they do not only have one mother tongue, but they may grow up with several languages. So you may find out which is the languages that, which is a language that these children where is your school is located grow up and that they master well when they come to school. So you may have a choice on that. Um, and then um, what's being done in some countries, I know from South Africa, Austria, 
also really because the, the ling multilingual context is so different in different parts, even within one country, in cities is maybe very multilingual. So then uh, one solution, I mean, there have to be more solutions, but one um, idea is to develop uh, linguistic school profiles which are based on the competences of the teachers, of the children, and of the parents, and then you make a selection. And this is also done in Burkina Faso through social negotiation processes with the communities, while being informed about what are the possibilities, or what is realistic, as um, the lady was saying, it's not possible to, perform, to, to highly perform in a language you don't understand well. Um, so they inform, for example, they bring in researchers, they explain also to the community, and then they have a real discussion process because it's a major shift that is nothing that you have ready-made solutions and there can be other solutions. But in Uganda, for example, you also have the tradition of bilingual education uh, among the Baganda people. They had negotiated with the colonialists to have bilingual education system. So you even have historical and you know people who know it works, and um, yeah, that's my qu answer to your question. And then um, the question from Nigeria about teaching pidgin English. I think if you take the multilingual ethos, uh, if you t as an approach to education, it would mean that you work with pidgin English as it's being used in uh, in uh, in Nigeria, but that at the same time you try to create people's awareness. What's the difference between, let's say, uh, British English, Nigerian English, so that when your uh, um, students in Nigeria also want to learn British English for purposes of going abroad, of reading and writing whatever academic papers later on, that they are even have, you, you teach them language awareness and um, try to really work with um, the linguistic profile of the learners and, yeah. And then Thelma was asking about, um, yeah, the, 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 the disconnect between, okay, let us use African languages in school, but what about jobs then? So that's why I said it's an intersectoral thing, and we need to val value African languages. Does not It should not only take place in schools, but also in business, where, for example, as uh, Daliedi has said, there's no doctor that can work with one language in an African country, no politician who can work only in English. So part of, for example, how can we value? We can value these languages by, first of all, making a category in CVs, what are your linguistic skills, you know, and um, give value to it. Um, that, that would be one way. And you uh, could give jobs to people because also of their linguistic profile. And so this is just one idea, you know, and yeah. Maybe I stop here so I don't take all the time. <laughs> I think you've covered it, Christine. I also worry about the fact that we, we think along the lines that every time we raise the issue of multilingualism or the, the education crisis in Africa, it is with, it, we say in either, either English or it is very, very important for us to strengthen what we call multilingualism because what, when you agitate or when you make a case for, for the child's basic right to learn, it is not about moving away from English. It is offering access to that child to learn something in school and still get English. And if that child's future depends on English, then that's a problem because they will not learn much in school because of the preoccupation of teaching them English. In China, kids learn through Mandarin. In Germany, they learn through German. They still speak English here now in this conference. So it is, every time the issue is about African languages, then these questions come. What about their English? But we forget that in Russia, they learn through Russian and they make Sputnik and all, everything else and they still speak English. So we must move away from thinking that when we raise the issue of language and education in Africa, it is going to take away mm -hmm. that right. Every child must be given an opportunity to learn English, but it must not be at the expense of what they will become tomorrow because they have dropped out of school. They might not even get to that interview because school has just become too difficult for them. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, I'll not be able to take another round of questions. 
I've been told that we need to wrap up. I know James, you probably are going to kill me, but both Naledi and Christine are here for the rest of the day. So uh, let us engage them and, and take it from there and network with them. But thank you very much. You've been a great audience and thank you. Yes, thank great you. presenters. A round of applause. Please. Thank you. <laughs> um, so just a quick, just a quick announcement about the program. Um, so because we're running a little bit behind time, we're just going to go straight into the innovation fair pitches.